In fact, in the six years since I've been in the program, uh, a lot has changed too. And I'm not up to speed with what they're doing, but uh, it's uh, money has continued to flow in with the uh, sensors, and a lot has taken a lot has changed in the last six years. I'm way behind on on what they're doing and the, and the, what they're doing quite well. In addition to the pods, we have uh, we have data links on the aircraft for beaming information around, and uh, the nose now, uh, rather than just have a, the simple nose like you'll see back from the 1960s, the Gary Power era, if you will. Now the nose, we've got two different noses that can go on the aircraft. One, uh, one we flew primarily when I was at RAF Alkenbury was a synthetic aperture radar nose called an ASARS, A-S-A-R-S. It's an acronym, Advanced Synthetic Aperture uh, Radar System. And we flew it there. Why? Because the radar takes a pretty good picture, and it's not affected by day-night. It's not affected by clouds. And as you know, Northern Europe, a lot of cloud we're looking through. And if we want to be able to see uh, enemy uh, radar sites, enemy tanks coming across, what have you, we want to be able to do that 24-7, and the, and the ASARS radar is very, very good for that. And again, since I was in the UK last, what, 27 years ago, the radar has improved dramatically. The other system that goes on the nose is an is a electro-optical camera, and it uh, just takes a big, it's a big digital telescope, if you will, or it's a big digital, uh, just a big digital camera. And it goes out and uh, it, it, it takes some pretty impressive, uh, it takes some pretty impressive shots, and it can do it in a wide, uh, wide spectrum. Uh, in the, uh, well, how do I even say this? It goes into a wide spectrum. I, I won't dive any more in, in, into that at all. And you know, there's a lot of areas that I could probably get into, but I'm always going to lean towards the side of I don't know really where I can go with this. So I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But uh, again, limited in some capability because of day night, uh, because of cloud cover, that sort of thing. Although there's been a lot of advances in that. And again, I don't know how how much they've done with that in the last six to six to eight years since I was, since I last flew uh, with, with the electro optical nose. And then finally the. Uh, You'll see a big, a big uh, kind of a teardrop tank on top of the fuselage on a lot of the aircraft now, and that, uh, that in case is a worldwide data link, so we can be I could be flying over Afghanistan, talking back to the ground site at, uh, at Beale Air Force Base or wherever, and I could be sending all the digital imagery and the signals that I'm getting, pump it through the entire system, and, and talking real time to the technicians and the folks that are on the ground that are, you know, you know, if you look like an RC-135, they carry 30, 40 whatever number of people in the back of the aircraft that are working the mission on the aircraft. We carry those people through the data link. So I'm the only person in the aircraft, but I've got a full building of people back there that are analyzing everything that's going on. So kind of diverging off of the, the pods and everything on the aircraft, but uh, the airframe itself hasn't changed a whole lot. We've changed the engine. We've changed the, the, the cockpit. We've put these super pods on there. But what goes in those super pods, what goes in that that uh, tank on the pod on top of the aircraft, those change on a regular basis depending on uh, how quickly the, uh, we get new technology and new equipment. It's interesting. I think this discussion around the mission uh, may be worth pursuing that uh, rather than sort of trying to come back to it later. I, I guess there's a sense that in the old sort of you know 1950s, 60s era of U-2 missions, the aeroplane was off you know, sort of flying maybe in places it shouldn't have been on a, a single mission out of contact with anybody else. How has the mission changed? And it sounds like now actually it's much more dynamic. Uh, it's much more sort of command and control sort of oriented. What, what yeah, is, it what really does it, is. What does it look like? Let's go, let's go, let me, to give you the background, you know, you, you talk about back in the day going where they, you know, where they shouldn't have been. Uh, July 4th, 1956 was the first overflight of Russia. Uh, July 4th, well, nice, uh, nice coincidence there for us, Independence Day. And of course, it carried on 28 flights through the 1st of May, 1960, May Day, when, when uh, Gary Powers was shot down on the aircraft. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you, you send your dog out the door and say, hey, see you in 11 hours, hope you make it back. And you just let your dog go and there's no monitoring. You're, you know, well, I hope my dog comes back. So you sit around waiting and, you know, 11, 12, hey, my dog, he's not back yet. I wonder where he is. And I, it's, it's kind of the feeling I, kind of the way I, I, I would imagine that they felt when they launched these aircraft out of Pakistan on the way to Norway or wherever across Russia. Hey, let's, in 11 hours, I hope he shows up on, you know, in the pattern to, to land. But what's kind of funny is uh, when I was flying in the UK in the 1993 time frame, we actually had a, we did fly a mission out of, out of the UK where uh, we, uh, we uh, I flew it twice. We would take off and uh, we would just hit the, uh, we didn't say anything. We just hit the ident and London Mill would come up on frequency and it kind of acknowledge us and we would just kind of head out and then Scottish Mill would pick us up and they would, we just, we just do a little, we wouldn't say anything. We just hit the flash on the ident on the, uh, on the transponder. And then uh, we hit coastline and whoosh, everything turned off and we just, we went away and uh, we weren't, we had an HF radio. We didn't have the data link back then. Uh, very, very few of them. They were kind of, kind of new. And we would, we, you know, again, I, was, I think that mission was about an 11 hour, 1045 
11 hour mission. And uh, you, it's funny to go to go back and think about that. The only way they get a hold of you is through HF radio, which, you know, you're sitting there the whole time listening to the HF. And, uh, you know, for 10 hours and uh, one, one of the pilots, I, I, I complained about it. And he, <laughs> he said, you listen to the HF radio the whole time because just turn it on five minutes at the top of every hour. If, they, if they're trying to get a hold of you, you'll hear them screaming. Not, don't worry about it. <laughs> I always got a kick out of that. But uh, compare that to uh, April of 2008. So uh, what's that? Uh, 15 years later, uh, we were flying a uh, we were we were, we were, we were flying a, a, a new mission, and uh, we actually had took got one one of the aircraft. We were flying. It was it was the old school. It was because uh, let me back up. In the 2000s, we started flying almost all of our missions with this worldwide data link. So you can't go anywhere with the YouTube without everybody watching what you're doing. So they know every minute of every day what you're doing, what you're looking at, which is great because in the warfighter, uh, where the warfighter needs on the ground, when we're actually supporting troops, which again, let's back up. You two, you told people from the 1950s and 60s that we're going to be flying as a tactical platform helping warfighters on the ground. They'd, they'd be stunned. You know, no, it's a strategic reconnaissance aircraft. We're going to take pictures, bring them back, give them to the National Command Authority and let them do their thing. But now here we are in Afghanistan, real-time imagery, uh, helping uh, helping troops on the ground, and uh, it, it's kind of a different ball game uh, with that with that sensor being able with that the data link being able to pump everything back. But here we are, 2008, and we're going old school. We've uh, we've got, uh, got cameras on the aircraft, and we have no data link, and off we launch. And I flew I flew one of the, I was uh, I flew one of the missions, and it was a 12 hour it was a 12 hour mission. It was uh, it was quite a haul. And uh, I remember uh, we I basically lost HF radio contact with them, but you know continue to press. No big deal. I, you know been did this years ago. No big deal. We all just get the mission done and come on back. And on the way back, I got the I got the you know the HF we got the HF kind of we got some signals back. I could hear the call sign. I and I, I made the call back. And in essence, what what happened was headquarters came back and said, we've lost HF, recall them. So they call, I'm already on the way back and they, hey, and you know, they called and they got a hold of me and, I, and they gave me the recall, the recall code. And I came back with a basically, why are you recalling me? Because we've lost radio contact with you. We're talking on the radio right now. Okay. <laughs> and I'm on the way back anyway, but it, it was just funny. I think the, I think the leadership over, you know, over 15 years had become so used to knowing everywhere that their dog, where their dog was the whole time. You can't let that dog go out for 10 hours by himself because that dog won't come back. Again, big, big change. And and now we have, we just, I don't think they do that anymore, Harley. We, we really just don't send the aircraft off without it having a data link, uh, being able to uh, track everything. And, 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 and really, it just gives it a lot more capability, having that near real-time capability to see and hear what's going on. on. What's the difference from a pilot's point of view then in, in terms of workload, the, the dinner? you know, dynamic nature of it or, or not, uh, you know, being prepared, knowing what, what's going on, having situational awareness, knowing who to talk to, managing radios. What, what, what does it mean to you? You know, the, the preparation is, uh, you know, when you get in theater, it's all new and it's just all the local procedures. Once you tend to get settled in uh, in country or wherever you're going to be operating, it, it certainly gets easy, much easier very, very quickly uh, for the, the normal procedures. But as we found flying in Iraq and Afghanistan, when we started really employing the U-2 to help with uh, troops in contact, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the workloads are really, really would go up. We had some, uh, I wasn't, never happened to me, but some of the, some of the guys that deployed a, a great deal during that time frame uh, were talking about, you know, they, they'd be up in the orbit and the only people, uh, they have troops on the ground that deep in valleys in Afghanistan and the only people they could get a hold of when they're in trouble was the U-2 sitting way up high, you know, we call, you know, in orbit, if you will. Not, we, we're not, obviously not, but because the line of sight, they could get us and the U-2 suddenly became a communication relay node where the pilot is now, you know, tracking through frequencies, trying to, you know, call in an A-10 support or, or, or do whatever was needed by the, by the folks on the ground. And it became, to, it got to the point where pilots would be up there doing, doing the mission and maybe had a, they had a very benign mission one day and the pilot's got nothing else going on. He's just, you know, monitoring the aircraft. He's got some, he's got some bandwidth on his brain and some of the guys did a very, very good job of just tuning in various frequencies that we had, listening to what's going on with folks on the ground and actively trying to find folks, hey, do you, you know, I'm here, let me know if you need help. I'm here, let me know if, I, if it's anything I can do for you. And in uh, many instances, they found themselves involved in a situation where they were able to help uh, help these folks that were in you know, troops in contact that were, that were uh, catching enemy fire. So it, it, it's, again, it's changed a lot as far as the sensors go. The sensors are fairly automatic. You know, you pretty much get them turned on, uh, continue to monitor the health of the sensors, and then let the folks on the other end of the data link take care of the intel they're getting and or some any any of the tweaks on the sensor. My job primarily uh, as the pilot is to be the you know to be the eyes and ears of what's going on real time in the cockpit and and being that person that can have some have some SA when I am over troops in contact 
in the in the event that does happen. That's somewhat of a more much more rare scenario, and obviously very rare today now that things are winding down. But uh, the job really is to get the aircraft where they need the aircraft, and and to make sure it doesn't end up being an international incident too. With regards to then you know pointing sensors, I think uh, the, the original U two had that sort of drift sight, so the pilot could look through a series of prisms and and see the ground below and have some idea as to whether or not he was pointing it, the sensors in the right place, the cameras in the right place. Uh, nowadays, you have an electronic cockpit. Um, mm-hmm. how, how do you point the sensors? Uh, you know, if you've got to point a missile or a gun or, or, or drop a bomb on something, typically you've got a little pipper. You, you sort of have some idea as to where it's going to go. What's, what's the equivalent in the U2 then? Well, like with anything nowadays, you know, GPS technology. So we know exactly, if we know exactly where we're at and uh, with, the G, with the GPS and we know where, where we're looking, they can, they, they have all the algorithms set up for the, uh, let's say for the, for the ASARS, sent, the synthetic aperture radar sensor. So they can, they, again, I, I couldn't tell you how they, how they work the software, the programs, but it's all, it's all worked, it's tied into the, it's tied into the inertial navigation system and where you're at and where you're heading to. And they put what's called a, a, a mission set. Uh, they, they basically have decided what, what they want to look at in advance. And the, the, the aircraft knows I'm here, the target's there, I'll aim the sensor there. So it's fairly well automated. Uh, it's, an, it's an automated process. If you enjoyed this clip and want more, you can go to 10 and hit subscribe. You get early ad-free access to all my content. Appreciate your support.